How goes it, everybody? And we're going to pick up where we left off in the last video. Uh, we are going to talk about nuclei and why the heck they are radioactive in the first place. So if we look at a nucleus, there isn't actually a way that we can just tell from looking at it, this is going to be uh, radioactive or this is not going to be radioactive. Um, there are a few rules that we could use that would uh, tell us with really high accuracy whether something is going to be uh, uh, radioactive or not radioactive, um, especially if it's a really extreme nucleus, um, like if we had three times as many protons as neutrons, we're like, oh, okay, well that's definitely got, not going to be um, stable. But um, for uh, nuclei that exist in nature, if you were just to go out there and find some atoms somewhere and look at it uh, and look at the number of protons and neutrons, with a very few exceptions, there's not really a way that we can just look at it and say, oh, this is definitely radioactive or this is definitely stable. Um, what we should really be asking ourselves is how the heck are these things stable in the first place? Like how those how does the nucleus hold together uh, to start with? Like let's not even worry about determining is it stable or unstable. How does it how is it even possible for it to be stable? Because if we think about a nucleus, the nucleus contains two things. The nucleus contains protons which have a positive charge and the nucleus contains neutrons, which have no charge, neither positive nor negative. And if there's one thing that we know about charges, it is that like charges repel each other. So we have a whole bunch of these uh, protons packed into this small area, like literally touching each other in this really small space, um, and they're all repelling each other. Electromagnetically speaking, they do not want to be next to each other at all. So how does a nucleus hold together when the electromagnetic force of everything in the nucleus uh, or all the protons anyway, in the nucleus are doing their darndest to rip the nucleus apart. Well, the answer to that is, even though the electromagnetic force is trying to rip the nucleus apart, there is a stronger force that is holding it together. And that is quite, uh, quite uh, uh, originally titled the strong force. That is actually literally the name of the force that holds the nucleus together. It is called the strong force. There are actually four fundamental forces in the universe. Um, there's the strong force, the weak force, which we're not going to worry about. Um, there is the electromagnetic force, which we uh, know very well. Um, we interact with the electromagnetic force all the time. Um, anything that's charged um, it's going to have electromagnetic interactions. Uh, and then there's gravity as well, which again we, we are pretty familiar with. Gravity is something we deal with literally every second of our lives, um, unless you're an astronaut, in which case uh, I am jealous that you do not have to deal with gravity every second of your life. Uh, but those are the four fundamental forces in the universe. Um, we never really think about the strong force and weak force because they really only show up in the nucleus or, or in individual atoms. They don't really have to do with um, interactions between different atoms, which is what we really deal with all the time. And what the strong force is, is it is actually an interaction between nuclei, uh, or sorry, between uh, neutrons and protons in the nucleus. The strong force is essentially a glue that holds the nucleus together by this really strong interaction between neutrons and protons. This is why if you look at the periodic table, as you go from really small elements like uh, helium, uh, lithium, oxygen, fluorine, those relatively small elements, the ratio between protons and neutrons is pretty close to one to one. Sometimes you might have uh, like a 
fluorine, I believe, actually has one more neutron uh, than proton. But the majority of those smaller elements, you have one proton for every one neutron. But then as you get to larger elements, and you get to things like uh, uranium, uranium, the closest thing that it has to a stable isotope is uranium-238, and it has 92 protons. That is a lot more neutrons than protons. It's something like 140-ish uh, neutrons. That's a lot more neutrons than protons. And the reason why it needs a lot more neutrons than protons is because you have 92 protons in there, 92 positive charges trying to rip that nucleus apart. And so it takes a lot of glue to hold the nucleus together. So as you get larger and larger elements, you need more glue to hold the nucleus together. Um, and that's why that the ratio of uh, neutrons to protons gets higher as you go to larger and larger elements. Um, <clears throat> this is also, by the way, why the only element in existence that can exist without neutrons is hydrogen. Hydrogen, uh, or protium, is what it's sometimes called. Uh, the isotope of hydrogen with just a single proton is just one particle in the nucleus. You have just the one particle. You don't need a neutron. You don't need any glue because there's no other charge repelling that one proton. Now you can actually have hydrogen with a neutron. Um, that's what we call deuterium. And you can even have hydrogen with two pro uh, sorry, did I say protons up here? You can have hydrogen with one neutron, which would then have a mass number of two. You can also have a hydrogen with two neutrons, which will have a mass number of three, and this is called tritium which if you watched uh, the uh, second Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie, they used tritium to make their little artificial sun, um, which is actually not entirely scientifically inaccurate. Um, tritium would actually be, uh, and is actually, very, very useful for uh, trying to create artificial fusion, um, fusion outside the sun. Um, anyway. Let's talk about uh, radioactive half-lives, moving on from the topic of why, uh, why nuclei are stable in the first place. So when we're looking at different radioactive isotopes, uh, one way that we can tell how stable a radioactive isotope is, is by looking at how long it takes for it to decay. All radioactive elements decay eventually. Uh, eventually, um, you know, billions and billions, if not trillions of years down the line, there will be no unstable isotopes left in the universe. Um, just because all unstable isotopes decay eventually. Um, but some of them decay a whole lot faster than other ones. Um, and this rate at which the decay occurs is most often uh, shown using what's called the half-life of that radioactive isotope. So the half-life tells you how long it takes for half of the atoms in a given sample to decay. So if I start with one gram of uh, uranium-235, which is the, uh, the more radioactive isotope of uranium, the half-life is how long it takes for me to have only a half a gram of uranium-235 left. Oops, didn't mean to click that. So, however long this takes for half of the uranium-235 that I started with to decay, that is the half-life. How long it takes for half of the sample to decay. Um, and there are huge variances in half-lives for different uh, uh, different radioactive isotopes. So thorium-232, for example, which is actually quite prevalent on the Earth. Um, it's not like iron or something like that, but there's there's quite a bit of thorium on Earth. Um, thorium-232, to be specific, it is so incredibly close to being stable. 
um, but it is technically radioactive. Um, it has a half-life of 1.4 t uh, times 10 to the 10 years, which is 14 billion years. So if you had a gram of thorium-232, essentially the Earth will be gone. <laughs> It will be it will be destroyed in a supernova uh, before this one gram of thorium two thirty two becomes a half of a gram of two thirty two uh, thorium. Um, it is just so incredibly close to being stable. Um, you could sleep with a chunk of thorium two thirty two under your pillow at night, and you would never have any. Like you wouldn't have any significant increase in your radioactive exposure. Not that I would suggest it. I don't really suggest having rocks of anything under your pillow when you go to sleep at night. But uh, it is, uh, practically speaking, uh, as safe as anything else in the world. Uranium-238 is kind of similar to that. Um, it has a very, very long half-life. Um, it's not quite as long as, as thorium-232. Um, but it is still, uh, relatively speaking, very, very stable. Um, the 235, if you remember, that's the one that's uh, more dangerous. Um, and it's just kind of mixed in with the 238. Uh, but if you had a sample that was pure, pure 238, um, it had a very, very long half-life. Uh, carbon-14, which you're probably relatively familiar with, has about 5,000, 6,000 year half-life, which is much closer to the... Uh, um, I mean, it's, it's a lot shorter than geological time scales, but it's, it's much closer to like a human-like time scale here versus the billions of years for the previous two there. But then you also have radioactive isotopes that are incredibly short. So radon-220, for example, has a half-life of a minute. So once it's created, every 55.6 seconds, half of it goes away. Um, that doesn't mean that it just, you know, turns into nothing. It just means that it's no longer radon-220. It's turned into something else, most likely some other um, radioactive isotope. Uh, but it is no longer radon-220. And then you have thorium-219, which, uh, remember up here, thorium-232, 14 billion year half-life, thorium-219, a microsecond <laughs> half-life. So the difference uh, here of three neutrons takes you from uh, 14 billion years to a microsecond in terms of the half-life. Um, so just because one isotope in a particular element is relatively stable does not mean that all of the isotopes um, are relatively stable. You can have dramatic differences between these. Uh, let me see, do I have a space here? No. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at example 17.4 uh, real quick. So in the book, what it says is, how long does it take for a 1.8 mole sample? So I'll go ahead and write it up here, 1.8 moles of thorium-228 which has a half-life of 1.9 years uh, to decay to 0 0.225 moles. So how long will it take for us to go from 1.8 moles down to 0.225 moles. Now there are s equations that I could show you that are uh, more useful uh, in that they can be used in any kind of situation no matter what uh, years or half-lives or anything that you're looking at. For our purposes, because we're keeping it fairly simple here, um, any time periods that pass in questions like this, they're always going to be in terms of a number of half-lives. Um, we're just not going to bother with getting into, you know, uh, fractions of half-lives or anything like that. So if we look at the problem here, we started with 1.8 moles. Because 
I know we're keeping it fairly simple and we're only going to use whole numbers of half-lives. What we're going to do is we're just going to start off with that 1.8 and we're going to divide it in half. So that would be one half-life passing. So we know we have at least one half-life. That gets us down to 0.9 moles. So we're not there yet. Divide it in half again. So we're going to take 0.9 and divide that by a half that gets us to 0.45. So that's the second half-life. Still not there. Take 0.45, divide it in half again. So we have a third half-life that's occurred, and that gets us down to 0.225 moles. So if it's unclear what I just did there, I took 1.8 divided by 2. That got me to 0.9. So that's my first half-life but that's not where we ended up, so we're going to go ahead and divide it in half again. That got us down to 0.45 moles, so that was the second half-life that occurred. Still not where we ended up, so divide that in half, and that gets us down to 0.225. So we had three half-lives that needed to occur for us to get from 1.8 down to 0.225. And so because three half-lives had to occur, the time that it took for us to do this is just three times the half-life. So 3 times 1.9 gives us 5.7 years. And that is our answer. So it took us 5.7 years for our sample of thorium-228 to decay down to 0.225 moles. All right, I hope that makes sense. Uh, in the next video here, we're going to pick up uh, just talking about some other kind of little, um, kind of just random topics about radioactivity. Um, I think we'll talk about, uh, yeah, some natural sources and unnatural sources of radioactivity, as well as how we measure how much radioactivity we've been exposed to. So I'll see you in the next video.